Well, actually, it all started back in July. I was on a motorcycle trip in British Columbia at a friend's place, and the weather wasn't looking too good, so we decided maybe we should put our rain gear on before we leave and ride off into the Kootenays. We're at Cranbrook. So I pull one pant leg on, I lift this leg, put my other pant leg on, I ruptured a disc in my back. So I laid in his basement for three days till my wife and son could get there to, to bring me back to Regina here. My son rode my motorcycle back. I laid in the back of our SUV because I couldn't sit. Um, then my sister got me in to see Dr. Uh, Vermeulen. With her being a nurse, I got right in right away. I had x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, like within a, like a week. And uh, had a ruptured disc, so it was getting close to harvest time. So I couldn't have surgery, so he put me on morphine for the, to get me through harvest. Um, we finished harvest Thanksgiving weekend in October. Beginning of November, I started feeling like, not feeling good, like really played out, didn't feel like eating. Um, coffee didn't taste good anymore. I drank coffee for 30 years. I just quit, just like that. It just wouldn't go down. I just couldn't drink it. My, my gums started to feel funny. My teeth hurt. So I texted Dr. Vermeil and told him, he says, well, maybe it's the morphine. He says, like, we kind of want you off the morphine. I was scheduled for back surgery December the 4th. He says, maybe try and come off the morphine. That way, once we have your surgery, we know whether your back is aching or whether it's just the morphine covering the pain up. I was getting night sweats like terrible nights, but sometimes we change the sheets three times at night. A lot of this stuff was symptoms of morphine withdrawal. And he says, you can't come off it too quick. You got to take about three weeks to come off. And uh, I was feeling so crappy. I thought, well, it can't be any worse. I just quit it cold turkey, just threw the pills away. And uh, it was around November the... 26th or so, I had my pre-op for my back surgery. Came in, they did blood work and everything. I, I felt actually a little bit better. And uh, they phoned, Dr. Duffy called me the, the next day and says, we see some problems with your blood work. I need you in at the Pasqua, December the 1st, for a bone marrow biopsy. And I thought, gee, like bone marrow biopsy, that's, that's pretty serious. So I come in, had the, the biopsy done. He phones me the morning of December the 2nd. He says, we need you back in at the general for 5 o'clock. We're admitting you. There's issues. So I came in that night. He says, you have AML leukemia. He said, it's kind of the worst one you can have. So I spent that night in the general again. Lenise was there with me. She's got connections through these hospitals like you wouldn't believe. She had worked at Bedline for a while. She had put the call into Bedline to make sure I had a bed that night. While everybody else was laying on stretchers and emerged, she called in a favor and they had the bed upstairs for me for that night. The next morning, December the 3rd, they took me downstairs and put what they call the pick line in your arm where they give you all your chemo and stuff. That e afternoon or evening, then we transferred over to the Pasqua. The morning of December the 4th, we started chemo. Like it would happen that fast because it was that serious. My chemo doctor had told me that if I would have waited another week, they probably wouldn't have been able to save me. That's how far gone it was. I had chemo 24 hours a day, continuous for eight days, two different types for the first three days trying to stop this. I think it was about 21 days after the start of chemo, they did another bone marrow biopsy. I went from 90% full of cancer cells to 4% with one treatment. I don't remember, like, everything's kind of a blur. At when Dwayne was admitted over to the Pasqua, and I sat with the nurse, 
sat with the nurse, and she asked him, what's your religion? And he says, now, right now, I'll take anything. We had grown up as kids in the United Church. We had the perfect attendance. We did everything. We followed mom and dad. We, we did it all. But we didn't have the, I now have the relationship with God, but Dwayne hadn't. But he saw how things had changed in me since I started going to Haiti and accepted Christ. And that day after the nurse left and I said, are you ready? He says, I'm ready. And that's when I phoned Pastor David and I said, you got to get here. And so between Avi and Pastor David, they came that night. It was probably like we just started chemo because um, I wasn't going to let him go and start this journey without Christ right beside us. I remember where I was here. So, yeah, they did another bone marrow around December the 21st. I don't remember the dates. I, one of my nursing friends from, from Saskatoon, she's a cardiac nurse in Saskatoon. I know her. I'm an officer with an air cadet squadron, too. And uh, she told me, she says, make sure you take a notebook with you and write everything down every day because she says, it's all going to be a blur. You're not going to remember nothing. What happens on each day? And uh, so it's all in my book at home. And it was right around that time, too, that uh, my hair started falling out. And it looked like the dog was sleeping in my bed every night because my pillows was all covered with hair. So Lanise has a, a hairdressing friend. So she came up, and we shaved it off. And, and it's just like a baby book. I got my piece of hair taped in the book on the day that, it, that it, we took it off. And uh, so then... I guess it was, well, it was Christmas Eve, you guys came by that night. And then on December 28th, <laughs> they told me I could go home. So I got to go home for, it was a week. And because uh, like right off the start, they like said, you're going to have your first treatment. Your blood work is going to crash. I think I got 10 units of blood in December and probably about six units of platelets. I for, like Again, it's all in my book. And then I got fevers and everything else and was on like antibiotics, intravenous, pretty much the whole month. And in isolation, couldn't leave the room anytime anybody come in to see me because like the chemo that I had totally wiped out my immune system. I had nothing left. And... Uh, they had to do it that way to, because like this leukemia, it's, it's in your blood. It's not like you have it uh, just in a certain portion of your body that they can just pinpoint it. Like it's through everywhere. And uh, so then I came back in on January the 4th for another bone marrow biopsy. And at that time, they did a, a spinal tap because the chemo that I had taken in December wouldn't get any cancer if it was in my spinal fluid. And uh, so then I came back in on January the 7th for my results. And from the, from the December bone marrow biopsy, beginning of December, they sent my bone marrow to Vancouver for genetic testing. And this determined how curable you are. So on December or January the 7th, we got the results. My bone marrow, like I said, beginning of December went from 90% full of cancer cells to 100% clean in a month. Um, the spinal fluid, 100% clean. The genetic testing came back 100% perfect. So I was admitted again that day, and they call it consolidation chemo. They just want to make sure that they've got everything. So it, over the next three months, I would get uh, two bags of chemo one day, 12 hours apart. I'd have a day off, two bags, a day off, two bags, and then I'd have to spend the rest of the month there. It would take about 21 days from the start of chemo for my blood work to crash, my immune system to crash, and then rebuild strong enough so that I could go home again for, for seven days, and then I'd come back again beginning of February, and then again beginning of March. The end of January, or when my, they call it your neutrophils, that's your immune system. When it,
goes to zero, like normal is 1.5 to four and a half, I think is the number. When it goes to zero, then they, in January, they would give me a, a needle to rebuild it fast. And uh, usually I got three of these shots every night. So the first night I got this shot, Got it at supper time. By nine o'clock, I could feel it, and some of the the side effects was lower back pain. So I could feel this like this pulsing in down in your hips, and uh, so it was starting to ache. So I went to bed, and by midnight, the pain was so bad I could hardly stand it. Like it was like somebody is doing CPR in your hips, like a pumping sensation, but it was just like squeezing you. And uh, so I asked the nurse for for some pain meds, and all they had on my paperwork was Celebrex, which is not a real good pain med. And to get morphine, they would have to call the doctor. And I said, no, don't worry. I said, don't bother the doctor at midnight. I said, I'll, I'll be okay. Well, it hurt so bad, I just couldn't hardly stand it. So I'm laying there in bed. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to ask for help tonight. I said, dear God, can you please help me with this pain? And it was just like that. It was gone. Just, it was unbelievable. Like, there's, there's no explanation other than he was there to help me that night. And the nurse come in about 10 minutes after I took the Celebrex, and she says, like, I think we better put a call in to the doctor to get you some morphine tonight. And I said, don't worry about it. I said, it's gone. She says, what do you mean it's gone? She says, there's no way that Celebrex works that fast. I says, no. I says, I had other help here tonight. I says, I don't know if you're a believer, but... You hear his work that he does, and I was no different. You go to church, you hear the stories, oh, well, but until it happens to you, I rolled over and I slept right through till 8 o'clock that next morning. And then the next, then during the day it kind of ached a bit. The next night they never give it to me because they, they didn't want to overload my system because this shot just throws your your bone marrow into heavy production for your uh, for your immune system. So the the next night it was about three o'clock in the morning. It was really starting to ache again. So I thought, you know what? I, I'm going to ask again. So I asked. I said, "Dear God, I said, can you help me again here tonight?" And it it felt like. Somebody pulled a blanket over me. It started at my feet, and it just went right up through me, like a really warm feeling, and kind of out through the top, and the pain just went away again. And I had two more shots, I think it was, the following days, and no more pain. Like, I, it was, I could feel the pulsing, but no more pain. February, same thing. I did my chemo. My blood work crashed. They give me the shots. The first night again, it started to hurt. I asked for help. The pumping sensation just slowed down, and the pain just went away. And then the same thing in March. And uh, I I come home March the 28th, Easter weekend. Yeah. Yeah, so it was right after... Pastor David was there, uh, my father-in-law, which is, is my wife, Kim, here. The first time he came in to see me, actually, they sent me a text right away and said that night after Pastor David was there that he had had a dream. Somebody had come to him in his dream, and he says he doesn't usually dream. And they told him, don't worry about Dwayne. He's going to be okay. We're there with him. And he said it was like, it was so real, but he, he said there was no faces to it or nothing. It was just, like, uh, he didn't know how to explain it. Like, And then he woke up, and he, 
and like everybody's sleeping in the house like but uh yeah so yeah i put my crop in this year seeded 3300 acres <laughs> yeah like with my <laughs> i should could have started this right off the start but I lost a, a really good friend to cancer. It was a year in December. It was a year that, to the day that I would, that was diagnosed, that he had passed away. He was 54, had cancer. We, I was a long haul trucker. He worked for me. We run California haul and produce, and uh, we biked together. We snowmobiled together. We made a few trips to BC. He always wanted to go back, but he never made it. So. When we buried him last summer, I have a little box of his ashes that I was, I was on my trip to BC taking him back to Toad Rock, this campground that we always hung out at. So when I first got sick, I said to him, I says, Aaron, I says, you got to help me here. I says, otherwise we're both going to be in a, in a box on the dresser in the bedroom. <laughs> so I've got his ashes in a little box and uh, yeah, we're plan another motorcycle trip back to BC this summer, so. Isn't God good? God is good. Hallelujah. We want to pray for you, brother. I, I just, uh, I believe that God has a purpose for you. Because you are going to carry his message of hope to the hopeless. And, and the purpose of you sharing this is to give God the glory. We want to give God the glory. Because sometimes we give glory to everybody else except God. And we want to thank him. For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. Lord, you deserve all the glory. You deserve all the praise. And we thank you, Lord, for our brother doing for what you have done in his life. Lord, we thank you that you taught him some things that he even when nobody's there, he could ask you for help. And I pray, Father God, that he will remember those milestones, those moments when he could ask for help and you reached and answered him and healed him and took the pain away. I pray, Father, that you will anoint him you will strengthen him, that he will share the same things you've done for him. You could do it, and you can do it for others. We bless his family. We bless his wife. We bless his children. We bless his farm and his work, Father. That, Lord, that the rest of his life, that no eyes have seen what you have in store for him. In Jesus' name, and God's people say amen. Amen. The Lord is good, isn't it? You can be seated. What what is that? Check up tomorrow at the at the cancer clinic. So Amen. He has a check and it's all going to be perfect. Hallelujah. Amen. God is good. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Isn't he good? 